なアルトマイクみたいになりたいでも電話してくれないオークランドとウクレンドから世界チャンピオンバーチャルプローズ始まるよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりバーチャルプローズよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよ I like to max and maximus and acuras. Your girl butt cheeks, I'm smacking her.、Huh? The raw rapper, spine snapper, with the little cuz on my lap. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna lie. 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 I'm not gonna Henny Omega, aka the Bad Man, aka Bougie Nagata, aka Dr. Keith Drapinski, aka Two Phone Scorpio, aka Super Brazy, aka Peak Gas Break Dip Dip, aka No Speak Broke Boy, Kami Shinsuke Stack a Mill Up. And with me, one half of the Holy Scheming Army, one half of Blood Militian, one half of the Heavenly Thotties, one half of the Bread Hunters, my main Oos, Mike. Hey, what's up, motherfuckers? It's Mike, aka Sticky Fuji, aka Crack Saber Jr., aka Tim Tam Bigelow, aka Dr.、Uh, Swagner Jr. Dr. Swagner Jr., there、God、we go. Damn, I was going to say, when are we going to retire this? But I don't think we can, but one <laughs>、yeah. day I'm going to figure out a way to angle out of this fucking thing. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't come up with a new one in probably like two years.、And、That's fine.、So I just have a list, but I realized I already had said a junior, so I, know, I, just, I stumbled. <laughs> I got you. Today's topic: our favorite wrestling introductions. Listen to Alan Mike for the first time ever on Virtual Pros. Passionately reminisce about old ass fucking wrestling. Hit us on Twitter and Instagram at VRTL Pros. Hit us on SoundCloud. Hit that heart. You know I like it. Hit us on iTunes. Leave us a five star review and subscribe, please. If you haven't already, peep us on Spotify. And if you want to participate, email us at virtualpros64 at gmail.com. We got a grip of emails, Mike. You mind starting off with that first one? Yeah, sure. The first one's from、uh, Tim. It's titled Wrestlers Being Too Dorky. Says, hey guys, sorry my last email was so long. I took an Adderall to get some work done, but got distracted and left a novel in your inbox. My bad. It's okay.、Uh, my new wrestling pet peeve is guys going overboard with dorky shit. I started noticing it with some of Gargano's comic book inspired gear. I don't begrudge Gargano for being a huge dork because I am too, but I roll my eyes a bit at things like his Avengers gear and Kenny's Undertale video from Wrestle Kingdom that I found to be very self indulgent. However, the worst offender. Has been Will Ospreay during the best of the Super Juniors. He comes out in a full Assassin's Creed cosplay and does a move called the Hidden Blade. It's too much. I'm not anti nerd shit and don't mind some references, but I do think wrestlers should be recognizable characters on their own and not just doing, be doing cosplay. What do you think about wrestlers doing references and cosplay? Keep up the good work, Tim.、Uh, the first time I ever saw Will Ospreay was like, I don't know, three or four years ago now. And he was dressed like Assassin's Creed then. And I was like, man, that guy's a dork. Cause I don't know. I, I think, I guess people like Assassin's Creed, but、uh, that game is just, I don't know. But, uh, but also I remember years ago now when Cody Rhodes was in, uh, in WWE, they had like a thing about how he had like the Triforce on his, on his, uh, on his boots. Yeah. And like it was like a big deal because it was like some video game nerd reference. But obviously, we've moved on a lot since then. And,、uh, I don't really mind it. I do think it's, it's gotten quite out of hand where a lot of wrestlers do it now and it's not just a handful, but I don't really have too much of a problem with it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't feel too strongly about it. Me neither. <laughs> Although I will say when I see Asuka posting up like, Pictures of her playing like shmups. I'm like, man, she's like a for real, like, game and ass dork. But it's kind of like when, say, like, Liv Morgan wears like Jordans. I think at the end of the day, it's just like really an easy way to get like traction on social media because people will talk about it. So I'm not too offended by it, but I do see why they do it. Next up is from Ryan Masks Over Hair. Hey, Vertal Boys. 
how to get my two cents in on your masks versus hair match issue. I find it hard to get hyped for hair matches anymore because more often than not, the loser usually ends up being better off in the long run. They end up rocking the short bald look for the rest of their career, Kurt Angle. Not to mention, it's pretty easy to just Photoshop someone bald and ruin the rest of your imagination. And while I agree that I don't necessarily care what either Hatfield looks like under their masks, I feel like the fallout from from a mask match is much more severe. Even if you don't take into account the lucha viewpoint of losing your mask equals losing your identity, there's probably a good reason why someone is wearing a mask in the first place. Odds are the face under that mask looks less like Dr. Wagner Jr. and more like Jigsaw. Damn. It's like when I saw King Diamond without the face paint and realized he looked like my uncle. The magic was gone. Hair grows back, but ugliness is forever. (laughs) So then, in the current era of Big Burly Boys, how hasn't there been a beard versus beard match yet? It would be the best of both worlds, combining both the thrill of removing hair and the shocking exposing of faces. Ryan at Dickman Comedy, a.k.a. Sleepsky not... Sleepsuke Napamura, a.k.a. Melatonin Niece, a.k.a. Alexa Pro Bliss. Yeah, that beard thing is a good idea. I'm trying to think of, like, who would look like the least tough guy once that beard is gone. Uh, not Otis Dozovich. He would still look pretty <laughs> funny. I don't know, but I do like this idea, Ryan. Uh, yeah, that is a really good idea. I am really surprised no one's done it yet. Um, is Brody, yeah, Brody King has a beard. T'Champa has that crazy beard. He has that fucking uh, God of War beard. Yeah. Um, it's tough because you can go back and see all these guys. You, you can see these guys with uh, with no beard because everybody started off with no beard at some point. Not not many wrestlers just started with a big beard. Hillbilly Jim would be crazy to see without a beard. <laughs> I don't think he's getting into a ring anytime soon, but... That would be a crazy one to see without a beard. I would have fucking... If he lost his beard when I was a kid, I would have probably cried. Dude, so. Hillbilly Jim versus fucking Bad News Brown, beard versus beard, that would have been <laughs> the hottest program of all time, I feel like. I'd be scared to watch that. Yeah, that WWF, you got to go back in time. and I agree. And uh, do that match. Um, next email is from Denzel. It's uh, titled, Sup Lads. Hey, gang. I lo- So I want to just preface this. I went to Eurovision. I watched Eurovision on uh, at a bar a couple weeks ago uh, at my girlfriend's behest. I didn't want to go see go go to watch it, but uh, I tweeted. I was like, "Hey, I'm at. I have to watch Eurovision. Does anybody want me to talk about it on the show?" Kind of jokingly, because I'm not going to really talk about it. But then Denzel emails about Eurovision, so now I have to talk about it. So uh, I love Eurovision for the uninitiated. It's American Idol, except with countries in Europe putting forth one competitor. The winner of the competition wins the right to host the following year. This year's winner was the Netherlands. Last year's was Israel. Uh, Much like American Idol, there are only a few acts from the show that anyone remembers the name of. What makes Eurovision better than American Idol is that it takes place once a year and the show is wackier. It features songs like Polish Girls or Great Value Guar and their song Hard Rock Hallelujah. The music videos and live performances are the most important part of the show. I've been watching it for the last four years even though it gets more and more self-serious every year. It's still enjoyable, fun, and dumb as shit. Ask Mike about Verka Suduchka, uh, the chap with the disco ball outfit and star on, on the head. The worst performance on the show this year is Madonna. Yes, that Madonna. She did Like a Prayer in her new song with Quavo. In a world where there are very few things that would be considered appointment viewing for me, Eurovision is literally the only thing I plan for a year in advance. Uh, everything else can get fucked. To cap it off, I'm I'm be pleased to know that there may be a second Eurovision during the year for the Asia region. It's the region that Britons call Asia, <laughs> uh, what Americans call Asia, and the Pacific Islands, including New, Zing- New Zealand and Australia. That'll happen quite literally if China will stop being massively homophobic. I need more Eurovision. Mike, assuming you watched enough Eurovision this year, which Eurovision gimmick would you want to see on Raw? Uh, here's a wrestling question. Do either of you remember what your first wrestling... What well, your first wrestling dork move in adult, adulthood? Uh, I emailed Brian. Oh, I th- I think he meant to say what was your first wrestling dork move in adulthood? Yeah. I I emailed Brian Alvarez in February about some dumb wrestling shit, and I've been upset about it ever since. <laughs> Denzel, aka Ryusuke Taguchi Wally Wally, aka Double Dutch Mantel, aka Ahagao. <laughs> I don't know what that one. Ahega Michi Marafuji, a.k.a. Uh, Bad Boy Hito Turkulu. By the way, I forgot who. I think it was, uh, 
I forget his IG name off top, but it's Morgan. He had DM me some fucking hangout at work, and I was connected to the Wi-Fi at work, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to get written up, so thank you, dude. Don't what ever that, do some that kind again. of cartoon porno? Uh, look it up, Mike. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to do that, but... Uh, so yeah, I, I go watch Eurovision, which is, it's a music competition, just like that email explained for you guys who don't know. I became aware of Eurovision a long time ago when they had the, as Denzel said, the, the, the great value Guar, cause there was like this, this band that dressed up like monsters and did a thing, but I didn't know what Eurovision was. I just knew they won some crazy contest. Um, when I started dating my girlfriend, she was into Eurovision and that's, Kind of how I found out that it, it's kind of like a, a gay thing in America. Um, where like, you know, gay dudes and I guess gay women too, actually love Eurovision. So I kind of knew that much. So I guess this year they didn't illegally broadcast it in America. So we found like there's one bar called Hamburger Mary's that was showing it in Chicago. And I guess this is like a famous drag bar. Um, I don't know how famous. I just know it's something like that. So we went there to watch it and it is like, it's I like all competitions, so it's kind of cool, and the pacing is good because it's like I think it's like something like twenty six different countries, so like twenty six different songs. And as soon as they said that, I was like, "Oh my god, I have to like this is gonna take forever." But they like they play those songs like back to back to back. There's no bullshit around, and that's pretty cool. And uh, basically, I didn't really pay much attention. There was like uh, this group from Iceland that dressed like kind of like I don't know, like if you were in like. If you want to do S and M costumes, but you went to like Party City to get them or something, <laughs> they're like—I mean, it was like a little more authentic than that. But you could tell they just did it because they were going to be in this contest, basically. But it was cool. There's a few other things, but basically, everybody's or it's a bar, so everybody's like drinking and getting drunker and drunker. And it made me realize that it—it really well made me realize a few things. One is that Eurovision is not only a gay thing in America, it's a gay thing everywhere. Like, like I, did, I thought, I just thought it was something that was like super serious in other countries where they were like, like, I thought it was basically like literally like the World Cup. Like they took it as serious as the World Cup. But no, it's just like, like all gay people just love Eurovision all over the world. It's not just America. And the other thing I found out is it really is like gay WrestleMania because not only like is everybody there super pumped for shit like an outsider does not understand like these people know all the songs they knew all this shit it was really impressive but when they are doing so the the judging portion of the show is really drawn out it's like it takes like 45 minutes for them to like tabulate the votes and stuff and they're like going by each country and it's just like this long process and they could they could shorten that a little but anyway um like this one dude next to me and like a couple other dudes like before the country would even vote on who they they gave all their points to, they already knew. Like they already knew ahead of time. Like they were like, Greece, it's your turn to vote. And they'd be like, Greece is going to vote for Iceland. And like two seconds later, they'd be like, Iceland. And it was like, they knew all this shit. And it's not fixed like wrestling, but they, I guess like they, these countries have patterns of voting. And like there's even, so there's even like that level of like, there hell, there's like a wrestling nerd that, Reads all the dirt sheets. There's apparently like a Eurovision nerd like that too. Do you think so, there are like Eurovision truthers? Is that a thing you think? I would imagine so. If oh, these people, shit. if these people knew this shit at a time, like they, they, they were like spot on to like rattling them off. It was huh. pretty amazing, but, um, but it was fun. Uh, it was like four hours long, just like going to WrestleMania or something. Um, I'm glad I got to watch an environment where I can drink the whole time. Because if watching that in like a theater or something where there was like no drink, so it would have really sucked. But uh, that's probably enough Eurovision chat for a wrestling podcast for uh, the rest of time. You want to answer? Uh, this, as, oh, uh, this question. I, I don't remember the first wrestling dork move. Um, I mean, outside of, I guess I was technically yeah, I was technically an adult. I mean, going to the New York City when I didn't live in New York just to go to, like, Japanese bookstores and buy Japanese wrestling magazines. I guess that's pretty dorky from, like, the outside looking in. Uh, this is easy, Denzel. This is me sitting crisscross applesauce at my uh, coffee table for three years now doing a wrestling podcast. <laughs> Next up is from is this Seagulls. Motherfucking yeah. Seagulls. Titled Sid Viscous. With the resurgence of Bray Wyatt as of late, I was thinking, remember that time he poured blood all over Finn Balor and the announcers called it a viscous red liquid for weeks? <laughs> Damn, that was dumb as fuck. 
Love Seagulls, a.k.a. Hardy Next Door, a.k.a. Taka Not Nice, a.k.a. Bull Pink Poppy. He'd also like to add, a.k.a. Lil Dross X. Yeah, <laughs> I do remember that, Seagulls. It was pretty <laughs> dumb. <laughs> uh, this just reminds me to bring up that because we're otherwise not going to talk about Raw, I don't think. But um, I was I was talking to Doan from Kissing Contest. What's up, Doan? Yeah, and we we're just talking about how it's 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 finally summer Raw hours, guys. So there's this there's sweet spot from like you know late May, early June to I guess late August where wrestling like WWE has no competition. There's no sports. There's nothing. They have until football. They have like a clear path. So I think me and Doan have figured out this is where they try their weirdest shit all the time. And uh, if the third hour of Raw from a couple days ago was any indication, it has started. Because it was... I only watched the third hour and I was like, man, this is fucking weird as hell. Um, So I think we are... I think... At the very least, we will see a viscous red liquid type deal, or I think at the very best, since that now WWE has competition, I think they are going to bring the rice out and they're going to bring back uh, faking Vince McMahon's death because they're going to have to do something big because they have competition. Okay, so I um, fell asleep, but I did catch that Sami Zayn was uh, seated in an electrical chair. <laughs> yeah. is, is that going to be his thing like every third hour now from the rest of of like the the season think, or what? What's going I on think, here? I think I was flipping back and forth, and I flipped on yeah, I flipped on it, and it was uh, the Usos and the Revival playing cornhole, and I was like, hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> and then I like turned it off and I put on whatever I was watching, and I flipped back, and it was that there was like a electric chair in the middle of the ring, and Sami Zayn standing there, and I was just like, what the fuck is this? And uh, yeah, that's a new segment, a new talking segment they have called the electric chair. Oh shit! Where, where, apparently a wrestler sits in the electric chair and, and Corey Graves hosts it, and they have people in the audience ask uh, screened or scripted questions. And uh, I think with the first or second dude that asked him a question, like had to remember what he was supposed to ask him because he forgot like halfway through. So it's already going well. It's already <laughs> one of the weirdest segments in the history of WWE, and I hope they keep it. I will say, if they do make some electric chair merchandise, I will probably buy a shirt. <laughs> just to remember Man, this moment. I really don't think it's going to make it past this week, but we'll see. Uh, next email is from Dave. Or it's not from Dave. It's, it's entitled Dave. It's from John. What's up, John? Uh, yo, I was listening to Jericho's podcast about the Blue Blazer with the god Dave as I was driving along f- furiously masturbating to Dave talking about paralyzing Stone Cold. D- D- Dave compared the Owen driver to the move. Scott Steiner did in Japan calling the Steiner Square Driver. Have I been wrong all these years thinking it was called the Steiner Screwdriver? Was my fapping messing with my hearing? Or was Dave flexing on all of us? With love, John, a.k.a. Richard Dawson. I looked this up, and as far as I can tell, it's always been the Steiner Screwdriver. I think Dave is, he's getting, he's gotten up in age. I think he's getting like senior moments every once in a while. So I think one, one of them might be, uh, thinking it was called the Steiner Square Driver. But I don't know. There's, there's, people out there that know all this dumb Japanese shit, so uh, maybe there's d- a different argument for this. <laughs> the square driver? That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's like one of those things where like American fans really thought it was like uh, the rolling elbow or the roaring elbow yeah. one of those things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to my understanding, it's always been the Steiner screwdriver. It makes the most sense. Square driver? Um, <laughs> I don't know what that is. Next email is from Deo, titled Virtual Bros Origin Story. What's going on, Vert Bags? I was just listening to the hella old episodes, one through three, and you guys never revealed how y'all met slash know each other. Al sounds like he's on a bad Tinder date, and Mike sounds like he doesn't even want to be there. <laughs> I guess I'm just curious, since Al is from out here, uh, he means the Bay Area, and Mike is from the East Coast. Anyway, keep bringing that champion pro rest shit. As always, peace and love, Deo, a.k.a. Flex Navarrete, a.k.a. I'll stand up 69-year bitch, and Tombstoner after I bust, a.k.a. Ghoul Summer Long, a.k.a. Yara Min Jean Okerlund, a.k.a. Jerry Frisco. Um, I kind of want you to go first, Mike. How do you think this all started? I think we first encountered each other on mes- message boards. Yeah, DVD. So, there's that. I should also... 
preface this by saying no one should go back and listen to these episodes. Yeah, please don't do that. Why'd you do that? Because <laughs> they're very bad. And I mean, to this day, I still don't think I really know how to handle doing a Skype podcast. Like, I don't think my delivery is ever proper. And uh, so that that's the, an excuse for the bad, de- <laughs> the bad delivery in those early episodes, because it's really different doing a Skype podcast over doing a live podcast, at least for me. Um, yeah, I think we met up in, like on message boards and then Al listened to my old podcast and then he kind of, I reached out on Facebook about trying to use my wrestling, no- wrestling knowledge to make money. And, um, he had this idea to do this podcast and make sure it's off of it. And here we are basically pretty accurate. Uh, but, no, I, I also, for, uh, yeah, I also forgot to mention we've met each other in real life. We're not fucking like we met each other before we did a podcast. So it's not super weird. Uh, is that true, Mike? Yeah. I don't think that's true. I think we had it's, met it's, after we started. It, no, it's frozen. for sure true. You just have a shitty memory. No, the first time I met Mike. It was five years ago. I actually just had the anniversary show on my Facebook, actually. No fucking way. Anyway. It was, it was, I, it was, it was yeah, because it was right after my art show, and my art show was five years ago last weekend. Oh, shit. You might be right. You're right. I met up with yeah. you and Don at that bar. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Uh, Yeah. Pretty accurate. I was a big Mike Stan. He did Bun Cocky, <laughs> which is a really, really funny lifestyle podcast. Uh, I don't know if it exists anymore on the internet, but that definitely got me through my days at work. And he also did a rap blog um, that I also enjoyed uh, reading. I don't think you could read that in 2019 and think no. that it's not problematic. <laughs> so I'm not going to... Did I drop the name? Um, if I did, I'll edit it out. But uh, he had a good rap blog. And uh Yeah. Five, six years later, here we are doing this virtual yep. pros thing. Uh, you have next. Oh, yeah. Next one's from Max. It's titled Honky Tonk Man's eBay Account. Hey, guys, it's <laughs> Max from Ohio. Wait, is this the, yeah, this is the next one, right? No, I, I skipped over Daniel, so you got to go back to that one. But um, So, Max, uh, hey, guys, it's Max from Ohio again. It's been a long time since I have had a good reason to email, but today I was scrolling Twitter and saw something worthy of an email. Have you seen Honky Tonk Man's eBay account? Here's the link. Maybe the best photos are Honky holding up the video games he's selling, or perhaps him holding up the random Rey Mysterio mask. It must be a small perk of being famous that you can put any random item you have on eBay with a photo of you holding it up, and it's slightly more likely that it will sell than if you took a proper eBay photo. (laughs) I thought this was pretty funny and wanted to pass it along. Good luck with the job hunt, Mike. Hey, thanks. And good luck with your pursuit of knowledge of women's athletics, Al. Uh, Have a good show. Real funny. Real funny. Yeah, I clicked on this. And uh, it's mostly, it is mostly him, uh, Honky Donk Man, selling his own memorabilia. When this, when I was reading this email, I was like, oh man, I really hope he's just selling like random video games, like just, you know, selling like a copy of like Rock and Roll Racing for Super Nintendo uh, and just him holding it. But unfortunately, it is mostly just his, you know, his worn stuff that he wants kind of ridiculous prices for, but I don't really know what the market is for used clothing from the honky tonk man uh it's um the the ebay title or the ebay user id is uh no bumps or no bump i think it's no bumps so yeah, no bumps. check yeah check that out if, if you want uh yeah it's funny because all this stuff looks like it was given to him like earnestly like he has a Rey Mysterio <laughs> Jr. mask that probably Ray Ray was like, hey, as a token of our, I don't know, brotherhood, you can have this mask. And now he's fucking peddling it on eBay. What a piece of shit. He's wearing a, a Milwaukee Brewers shirt as well yeah. in this photo, which is pretty funny. He also has a, a very rare WrestleMania 3 photo. So for the attendance troopers out there, maybe you can do a head count. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's worth peeping. Uh, eBay account, no bumps. Really good feedback. He's selling one of his like banners that we put up at a table if he is at a convention. So if you want to have, you want to cosplay as Honky Tonk Man for Halloween, that might be, it's pretty cheap too, if I recall. So that's, uh, might be worth looking into. What are you going to do? Like fucking like pin it behind like your dinner table? Where would you put this? I don't know, man. (laughs) People buy dumb shit. So shit. Preach it. (laughs) Last email of the night is from my man Dan titled Hi. Long time since the last time. The podcast is, as always, a gem. I appear to be typing this while wearing my third anniversary tee. It's comfy. Come on. I'm not a hyper fanboy. I promise. We want you to be, man. Please. <laughs> if I remember from a previous episode, Al bought one of the ECW tie-in compilation, compilations once upon a time. So what's your favorite pro wrestling soundtrack? 
Out of all the wrestling CDs that you heard, what's the best? And is it the one where Styles P says he's... <laughs> wait, is it the one where Styles P says he's leaving out the building with the Nitro Girls? Is that a real bar? Much love, Daniel, a.k.a. Kagetsuwu. Um, no bullshit. I think it was volume four of the WWF uh, soundtracks. It's the one with the Jericho theme. That has to be the best one, pound for pound. I remember blasting that one in my car. Um, that was always a good time. Um, nothing beats that. I didn't cop the aggression album. That was the rap album with the uh, graffiti font that all Asian bloggers used back in the day. <laughs> um, I think Rascast was on that album, which was fucking crazy. Um, the Run DMC DX song was on there, which is actually pretty okay. Um, uh, but that's my answer. I think it's volume four. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to say zero. I don't have any, but I did get that aggression CD. I got a, a bootleg version off Canal Street. Oh, back shit. in the day and i was so excited to get it and it stunk it, i mean <laughs> i don't know what i was but it had rappers i really liked at the time like cool keith is on it uh ra the rugged man which i won't admit to liking him now in 2019 but you know this is a long time ago so uh and at the time he was kind of still like this wild guy so it was just like man they got ra the rugged man to be on this um so uh I got that and it was just like, oh, this is just like shitty wrestling music, but with rappers. <laughs> and I was really, I don't know what I was expecting, but I was really disappointed. Uh, I would say if I could, and I know, I think it might exist, but I think it's just a CD and I'm not going to pay more than like $2 for a CD. But, uh, I would say like the stardom theme CD from like a few years ago, I would probably, that would probably be my favorite. <laughs> what? Are you serious? Yeah. I think, I think, uh, like a few years ago, they probably had like, some pretty good music. Like they had that Oi to Tai song. Okay, okay. Uh, and yeah, they they had they had that. Or if like New Japan put out like a, a theme CD too, because I think all their themes are pretty listenable. But um, those things don't exist in my world. All I have is American wrestling soundtracks, and I don't like any of them. I'll admit to fucking putting on that Naito theme on the treadmill. That shit gets me fucking crazy. It's like an F Zero <laughs> fu- like song. I don't know. Um, as an aside. I think that Macho Man Be a Man record on CD is going for like 300 bucks on eBay. (laughs) I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, I want to say that that's true. So if you see it like at your whatever, like your your resale store, you should cop that shit and then flip it. Anyway, pretty fun mailbag this week. If you want to participate, email us at virtualpros64 at gmail.com to man scramble time. And I got some things to talk about. Um, I forgot to bring this up last episode, uh, but a big thank you to Drug Dogs for releasing another incredible print. I believe they start shipping this week. Uh, so for those of you that copped one, as always, thank you. And uh, please send how they look like in your living spaces. I know I love it. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, what happened? Did you ask me a question? I just stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave this in. This is the fucking pitfalls of recording. <laughs> was I? I don't know. Was I supposed to say something? I, I zoned out for a second. It, it's okay. <laughs> okay. 88 episodes, man. Still got it. Uh, next topic. You don't want to say thank you either, Mike. What the fuck, man? Ungrateful. Anyway, next topic. No, th- thanks everybody. <laughs> Whatever. We'd like to make an addendum. Maybe just me for the previous episode. So apparently Mike and I were too slow to realize that in the Gino Hernandez and Chris Adams versus Kerry and Kevin Von Erich match, oh. uh, it was billed on TV as the main event, M-A-N-E, like you know, Gucci Mane. And uh, Mike <laughs> thought that was a typo, uh, but in fact, it was a pun. Yeah, and I, I think like the idiot. next day, like 90 people called us idiots. So uh-huh. I guess I apologize. And if you're listening to Virtual Pros... Expecting intelligent conversations. I have some pretty bad news for you. I'm still going to fight it. Seems a little too clever for wrestling, but especially in the <laughs> 80s. A little too clever. I don't know. I would. I think it would be more likely for them to spell that wrong than be that clever. Uh, my last bullet point. It's what I feel like everyone wants to talk about. It's double or nothing. So yep. I have a question tied to double or nothing, but I thought we'd take the time to talk about what we did and didn't like. Maybe we can do this as like a t-shirt review style. With some mm-hmm. pros and some cons, maybe a final grade. Mm-hmm. So pros, like from what I saw, admittedly, I saw like the last half, the first half I was at a graduation party. I thought it was pretty solid. 
Um, the wrestling was really good. I don't think anyone was surprised by that. Like, I feel like the top tier of the card, like, I'm not mad at. I'm not, like, over the moon about it. But I think this might be, like, one of the funner mid-card rosters we've had, like, in a while. And, like, production-wise, it felt like WCW. Like, I guess not surprisingly, I think MGM Grand was a building that they ran a lot. And this is a Turner product. Uh, this could be a negative to some, but I always dug WCW because it looked a little darker than WWE. It was, like, lit differently. Uh, but I don't think we should fear, like, bad production. Um, I don't think that's in the cards. Um, some cons. Uh, I think if you're going to fire shots at WWE, it has to be harder than fucking attendance jokes and, like, breaking a chair. <laughs> like, I know you have some thoughts about it, but that was, like, way too much. Uh, not much else than that. I thought it was, like, a pretty good debut show. It was pretty decent. It was pretty decent. I'm going to give it a B plus. What would you think? Yeah, all the the last three matches, like the marquee matches, were all pretty good. Uh, the, the Omega Jericho match had a hilarious ending, even though it's not supposed to be hilarious, and you're supposed to pretend Jericho's new uh, slow spinning elbow is a dangerous move. But outside of that, you know, the rest of the match was pretty good. It wasn't as good as their last one, but all those matches really delivered. I thought the uh, the women's the Japanese women's match was uh, pretty good. I refuse to say Joshi. No, I'm never going to say that word again. This is the last time you hear me say that word because Joshi women's bro, you got to call it the right way. Yeah. Joshi women's wrestling, women's that, women's wrestling. They have really done a good job of putting that into more mouths than it should be. So uh, it's just women's wrestling. They are they are re- they are women and they are wrestling. So that's what it is. Uh, but. I you know I thought so I I think they did deliver on those matches that that's definitely the pros the, another pro would be that it does feel a little different feels like they have a grasp on actually being able to tell stories through wrestling instead of through hour long promos and stuff like that so that's cool the cons for me were yeah that WWE shit was real corny um even though they're talking about how much they want to be different than D- WWE there was like they are doing like the crazy nine million cutaways for like one move kind of shots, which is like I I I don't know if they're really doing it on that purpose or on purpose or they're just like had bad timing or something because it could seem like it went either way. They are also doing a, a an abundant amount of the crowd shots where they're showing like crowd reaction shots to every move, and no one wants to see that. WWE does that because they're insecure and they want to make it like they want to show reaction so people at home can be like oh man that goober in the audience is reacting so i should react too but you shouldn't have to do that if you're not wwe so i would i would like lay off that overall uh it's definitely better than the average uh wwe pay-per-view so i would definitely watch again uh i would also give it probably a b plus all right we saw that story i think of a dude apparently shitting in his pants in the audience <laughs> you think that's real or fake as yeah, these are these last two things were uh, both my uh, two man scramble too. Um, <laughs> it's tough. It's and when I first saw that that Reddit thing, I was like, eh, it's probably fake. But as the days go by and more and more stories come out about um, horrible attendees of this thing, I would say it's maybe it's true. Um, I I think it's possible that the person who's writing it thought it was true um and maybe he's just over exaggerating and it could have just been anything it could have been a dude who's just like a horribly smelling person because he has like some fucking shitty thing in his life that makes him smell like shit all the time like just not showering or something like that so i wouldn't say it was definitely somebody shitting his pants but at the same time if there was any cra- any re- any specific wrestling crowd where you, you like if you told me guess uh who's more likely to shit their pants and sit in it like <laughs> out of all these wrestling crowds i would probably go AEW <laughs> AEW would probably be number 1 because they seem you know unfortunately they have those kinds of fans so, <laughs> so uh but i at the end of the day it's tough for me to believe somebody could shit in their pants and sit in it but again i'm not that type of person <laughs> so, uh it shit disgusts me so um maybe people do shit their pants and sit in it all the time and i don't know but uh i hope it's not real but it's probably there's probably at least some truth to it i would say stone cold lock for me i would bet the <laughs> fucking farm on this there are so many buffets in las vegas and this guy probably didn't want to miss a minute had to have happened i believe in this wholeheartedly 
<laughs> um, my question though, tied to uh, Double or Nothing though, you got to break out that Mystic mic for a second. Ten years from now, what's going to be the more revered pay per view debut, Double or Nothing or Barely Legal? Um, I don't think people are going to care about Barely Legal ten years from now. Oh my god! Yeah, so I think just out of just because of age that people remember AEW more at the same time it's tough to say because um they could just like fucking bottom out after a year and people kind of forget it but considering if they're around for at least the next five years i think the AEW pay-per-view will be remembered more fondly it makes me sad but i have to agree i think people are going to be 50 people are going to die off and not remember (laughs) barely legal yeah and uh there's already enough people out there that are like ECW is never good. Like there's already those types of people that already exist. So plus Dave was pumping the brakes on this dude catching a turnbuckle at this pay-per-view. <laughs> and he's like, that's going to be worth like a million dollars. That might be the new dialogue. We have to carry on from here on out. <laughs> that was my last bullet point for two man scramble. Okay. So I was mostly going to talk about AEW and uh, this dude shitting his pants too. So that's fine. The uh, I only have one other thing, and it's uh, it's going to be pretty brief. It's a Chikara Road Report. I oh, went shit. to I went to Chikara last weekend to uh, see Scotch Mist in Chicago. It's part of their seventeenth anniversary weekend or something like that. Yeah, seventeenth. Uh, I don't really watch Chikara anymore. I used to watch it a lot back, like in two thousand five, two thousand six, around then. Actually, I guess no, two thousand seven. Yeah, you know, between those years, I watched it a lot. Um, and I just, it's just like, it's not what it used to be, at least to me, I don't think. Uh, but I'm still willing, I still check out King of Trios because that's usually always good every year. And, um, I'll definitely catch it if it's down the street from my house and it happened to be down the street from my house. So I went and, uh, it, it was pretty cool. It's, it was in Logan Square Auditorium and it was nice to be in that building and not have it be completely packed. Probably not good for Chikara, but, good for me because i like i like space so it was nice to just be, be able to stretch out no one's standing in front of me or nothing like that so that was pretty cool uh a couple things couple bad things i would say are um it's pretty for whatever reason i don't know if this is like a midwest thing or an illinois thing or just a chicago thing but it seems everything you go to here has a goddamn 50 50 raffle that's just a thing it's like commonplace for any kind of public gathering here and so that's it's pretty normal fake for AAW to have it. Even freelance does it. Like any wrestling that I've been to has it. So um I guess when I was like getting beer or say like talking to somebody, my girlfriend was sitting out at at our seats and uh, she she bought some of the raffle tickets and she was, you know, I came back, she's like, Oh, I got some raffle tickets for the raffle. I was like, Oh sweet, there's not a lot of people here. That means there's a good chance of us winning, even though it probably won't be as much money as usual, but whatever. So we sat down, and I think like a match or two went by, and the announcer's like, don't forget to buy your raffle tickets for uh, these three DVDs. And oh, I was like... no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, man, you got raffle tickets for DVDs? And she was like, oh, I didn't know that. And she was pissed, too. We didn't win. We actually, we came like one ticket away from winning, so... <laughs> But I was like, man, those are just going to go right in the trash. Like, no offense to Jakara or anything. They could have been DVDs from anywhere. And they're just, they were just like, I would just feel like keep them. But <laughs> I just like, I know, I would like to, I don't know if we have any listeners that still actively buy DVDs. But I know it's a thing. And like, there's wrestling companies still make DVDs and Blu-rays. So if you are a person out there that still collects these DVDs. To this day, not just PWG, because I know their whole deal is they have to be difficult and only put stuff on, on DVD. But if you are still actively buying all these DVDs, I'd like to know, because this just seems like I understand that it's physical media. And if you really want to keep it forever, that especially something like independent wrestling, this is probably your own only guaranteed way. But I'm not that guy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to hold this stuff forever. But um Especially on DVD, that's just, ugh. but, um, so that was like kind of a letdown. So, Chikara, if you come back to Chicago, just remember to do it a 50 50 raffle because I don't know. I, the people who won the DVDs were happy, but, you know, ugh, man, that was a letdown. But, uh, another weird thing is so they had this, this, uh, mask versus mask match and it was pretty cool. Um, we, we sat at the, the side of the, the, 
venue that was like we usually sit on the camera side so we're seeing what you would see if you were watching on tv basically but we sat on the opposite side where it's you know facing the camera and um so like when he took his mask off we didn't really see it because he was facing the camera and so like the next day i went on uh i'm sorry so there was a mask versus match mask match if you didn't listen to the last episode it was nasher hatfield versus boomer hatfield uh spoiler alert if you're waiting for that dvd the aforementioned dvd but uh dasher hatfield loses and he sits in his chair and he takes his mask off and we didn't really get to see like a, a clear shot of it it was like real quick and i think he like ran out or whatever and then like so the next day i was like oh let me check the like twitter let me check with shikara twitter uh let's see get a good look at this guy and uh there's like nothing <laughs> there's like nothing on their their page about it uh or on their th- twitter about it i just like searched his name on twitter i couldn't find anything and i was like man that's that's just like you don't see you don't see that in 2019 <laughs> like you know you don't go to like a wrestling promotions twitter for like this big event and not have anything about it so i don't know i don't know if that's you know they're just busy they don't have like a so like a dedicated social media but that just seems kind of strange to me um but outside of that it was an enjoyable show i I like that kind of goofy shit a lot uh i do think it's kind of like they're still pretty into like long-term storytelling where they have like some weird science fiction monster angle going for their entire season so there's a lot of shit that was over our heads because i don't really watch shikara and uh so that you know that was kind of like hard to understand oh also another thing is mike quackenbush like a few days ago or like last week made this announcement that you know he's fighting 25 matches in um the next 25 i don't know what he said like the last the, the next year or something but it's this big thing because he's like semi-retired and he's like this legendary independent wrestler i mean i was fine if i didn't see him because I've, I've seen him a, a few times at this point but um he did like a surprise match and he got his ass whooped in like a minute and a half. And that was fucking weird because when he came out, people like they, they lost it. So I was like, oh man, people are pumped for this. And then he lost in like 90 seconds. And apparently it was just to like sell how powerful Ophidian is. And it's just like, I don't know, man, you're going to make a big deal about wrestling these matches. And then you do like a 90 second match. It's kind of weak shit, <laughs> but whatever. Uh, another, another positive though, is that when they hit that intermission, and they're like, oh, go, go to our merch tables to get shit. That was like the most people I've ever seen rush to a merch table in Chicago. Like they, they must have sold. I don't know. Maybe it was just people window shopping, but it was just like at least like 80% of the audience went to, to their, their merch area. So that was cool for them. But, uh, yeah, overall enjoyable show. If Chicago came back like once a month, I would probably go just because, like I said, I'm into that goofy shit, but, um, just those like little things are just kind of like bothersome, but you know, this wouldn't, this wouldn't be funny. It wouldn't be a funny joke podcast if I didn't have funny stuff to talk about. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that was uh, my time at Chikara. Speaking of Chicago and wrestling, I did see that NXT is supposed to run a takeover in November, I believe. Oh yeah. Is it, is it that cold in November? I don't know, man. I I feel like it's still fucking cold. At, uh, we're going into June. I feel like we're it's going to be 90 degrees until at least October this year because <laughs> it's just that's like fine. that's perfect. I feel I feel like that's going to be the balance this year. You don't uh, want to come in for all in part 2? Oh shit, that's right. It's all out. Yeah, I'm I'm not really I'm never going to go to an AEW show like pant shitters, this other stuff I heard about. I I don't ever want to go to AEW. <laughs> we can get tickets, Mike. Come on, dude. Let's go all out. Let's do it. <laughs> Today's topic our favorite wrestling introductions. Listen to Alan Mike for the first time ever on Virtual Pros. Passionately reminisce about old ass fucking wrestling. Please stay tuned.
with episode 88 of that world champion sound today's topic our favorite wrestling introductions so since all sorry all lynn since double or nothing <laughs> is a very topical thing these days i thought i'd dedicate this segment into our favorite introductions it doesn't necessarily have to be shows at least i didn't do it that way it could be wrestlers it could be anything um so i'll start off um i try to think outside the box so i thought about What's my favorite weapon in wrestling and how is it used? <laughs> so I think it's pretty well known that uh, we at Virtual Pros, we love our props in wrestling. We love seeing carving knives. We love seeing bugs. We love seeing circus nets. Uh, but there's nothing more that I like seeing than some good old chair work. Shout out to La Parka. Shout out to the Van Terminator. The Arabian Face Buster. I like you too. All those things. Uh, but there's one chair-related move to me that like kind of stands uh, head and shoulders above everything. And that's when Stone Cold Steve Austin had had enough of Brian Pillman's shit and snapped his leg with a Pillmanizer. <laughs> um, when this first dropped, I watched this shit live and I was like, man, Stone Cold must really hate Brian Pillman. Like, that dude is forever going to walk with a limp. It just looks so devastating even to this day. <laughs> and now in 2019... We got people doing fucking head pilmanizers. Like, <laughs> this has to be like, like the best, the goat weapon attack. Like, to me, like, it is, and like, it could, you know, never be dethroned. Like, this shit is crazy. <laughs> do you like a pilmanizer, Mike? I do. It's still an effective looking move. Me uh, too, man. It always makes me question if maybe it just doesn't do anything at all, but I don't, I don't want to test it out myself, so I'll yeah. never know. <laughs> it's scary, man. <laughs> Uh, so mine, and I didn't really do, I did like debuts basically, but not debuts of just wrestlers, even though my first one is going to be a wrestler, but it's, it's kind of, uh, I did it as if, uh, it was still back then basically. So I'm not like looking back at it. So a lot of these things end up being disappointing once I debut, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it's things that got me like the most pumped once I heard they were going to happen basically. That's good. Uh, so the first one's my basic bitch pick and it's would be on everybody's list and it was uh Chris Jericho's debut to WWF. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's that's just an easy home run. Uh he was one of my favorite wrestlers, if not my favorite wrestler in WCW. So I can't remember you know how far in advance people on the internet knew, but you know, I think we had a good month when we knew that that countdown thing was leading to Chris Jericho. So it uh it built up a lot of anticipation and then he did that now that now classic promo that uh, everybody remembers and I, we've talked about it on the show before but i remember people on message boards just like printing it verbatim and stuff like that and like it was it was a huge deal even though i thought it was kind of underwhelming because i just thought he's gonna come in and kick stone cold ass or something but and then like they kind of just made him look like a bozo for three months <laughs> just like they used to do to everybody that was coming in but uh overall i think he had a good run so I think that's probably my least disappointing debut, <laughs> debut out of the three I picked. Uh, but yeah, Chris Jericho, WWF. I think that happened in Chicago, too. Could be. It's also, we found out, it was also the same episode as, uh, you've seen the big show? I'm telling the big shots, looking for him. <laughs> Shout out to Bob Holly. I know you're listening. I know you're a vert bag. <laughs> I miss you, man. Good lead in. So uh, this is a wrestler. So honorable mention to Chris Jericho and Raw, like Mike said. Scott Hall and Nitro. Uh, who else? The Radicals. They debuted yeah. that, uh, hey, we're sitting front row. <laughs> they do that move now that, like, you see at every takeover. Uh, but there's one guy, like, I was dying to see for, like, it felt like years, even though it was probably, like, a couple months. And I think it might be, like, the best combo debut and match, like, I've personally ever seen. And uh, maybe Nakamura versus Zayn is up there as well. And that's when Rey Mysterio debuted in WCW. <laughs> so like he's like up there. He oh, was yeah, up there. we talked about this in earlier because you were watching Triple A when you were eight years old. Yeah, when I was wa when I was fucking <laughs> scouting as a five year old. <laughs> like, yeah. He was up there with like Kabashi and Sabu and Masawa as like these like PWI magazine myths. Yeah. That I was like dying to see and like I can only read about because like I was only twelve and I wasn't like a grizzled tape trading veteran like I would be three years later. So when like he showed up against Dean Malenko at the Great American Bash, I was pretty stoked. And I'm, yeah, like I said, we talked about this on an older podcast because I was a five year old when <laughs> yeah. Rey Mysterio was wrestling as a 10 year old. Um, but yeah, I remember even saying, like, I thought this match, like, was actually kind of slow at first. And I was like, this is it. 
<laughs> and then like that shit fucking picked up and then like from then on he was like appointment television a month later he wrestled psychosis at bash at the beach the famous bash at the beach and that's like a personal classic of mine as well and so i think these like two months is where like i established myself as like a lifelong ray ray fan <laughs> uh by the way dominic not sticking up for his old man while Samoa Joe is whipping his ass is like high key some of the most cowardly shit I've ever seen on uh, WWE programming. But Rey Mysterio, I think my favorite debut. Man, I don't want to see Dominic become a WWE wrestler. I really hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, he do- he doesn't look like a dude who should be wrestling. He looks he still looks like a tiny child, even though he's like a giant child. But still, he's big man. Uh, on the same note, I didn't choose it, but. I had similar feelings for Ultimo Dragon. I just didn't choose it because I don't think I actually saw his debut because I wasn't really watching wrestling like that. But I remember seeing the vignettes and showing him carrying all those belts. And I was just like, man, this guy must be like the biggest ass kicker of all time. He has eight belts. (laughs) And so I remember getting like really pumped for his debut. Uh, But no, the one I chose is a uh, a mat. It's a type of match. And it's crazy because when I researched this, in my brain, when I was thinking about it, it felt like I had like I had months of buildup until this match happened, and then it turns out I did not because it is the fabled Inferno match, <laughs> um, which apparently happened the paper or yeah the pay per view right after WrestleMania 14, which is wild because I only started watching WWF again uh, the Raw after WrestleMania 14. That was the first time I watched WWF in like a few years, so. I can't believe like I went from just that one episode to them building up the Inferno match to me thinking it was going to be like the greatest fucking thing on earth uh, because it's if you guys don't know the Inferno match was a match they promoted as like it was Kane versus Undertaker and there was going to be fire surrounding the ring and the other thing I can't remember is if I already saw the Sabu Sheik uh, fire match I'm pretty sure I did at that point. And I thought it kind of stunk because it's like, it's like, I don't know, it's like two minutes long. And the, the, if you never saw like the ring just immediately catches on fire and everybody just kind of runs out. Um, but I think, yeah, cause I think I thought like WWF was going to do it right because they had like the money to, uh, do a fire match. And I, uh, I remember at the time when it finally happened and they finally did the fire match being completely underwhelmed. I don't know what I was expecting, but I think I was really expecting somebody to have their whole asses lit on fire. And that didn't happen. All that happens is a part of Kane's uh, covered up arm gets caught on fire. And it looks like, you know, like when they do it like as a stunt, basically. It doesn't look natural at all. But I, I watched it uh, earlier today just to see if it if it was really bad. But I think it's, you know, for what it is, it's uh it's pretty good. It's um the way the fire set up. It's like if. You just, you just had like those, I don't know what they're called. I'm not a pyrotechnician, but it's just like they have these long metal grids surrounding the ring, like a foot away from the ring that just have like, uh, like little fire things going up little flames. And anytime somebody does a big move, they like press a button to make the flames go a little higher. And, uh, looking back at it, I thought it was going to be super corny. And I mean, it is, it's fire surrounding a ring, but it's, it holds up a lot better than I thought it would. Uh, they would go on to do, another Kane versus Undertaker Inferno match on Raw, and then I think Kane versus Triple H, and then finally it ended with Kane versus MVP, the uh, probably least talked about Inferno match, and then I think they retired it, but man, I remember being so pumped to hear about a flyer match in WWF and uh, being let down. I I might have dreamt this, but wasn't MVP in an Inferno match? And like, the, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I just said that. Yeah, He was the last one. Yeah, and, like, you kind of knew that, like, he was going to get burned because he had, like, petroleum jelly all over his fucking arm. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I was like, yeah, of course he's going to get fucking lit on fire. <laughs> yeah, he had it on his back. His back, that was, like, the most gruesome one, I guess you would say, because it was actually on, like, a part of your body that would suck. Like, the, I think the second one, it was just Kane's foot, and it was like, come on. Like, you, you can't, <laughs> like, at least his arm is, you know, his arm. But, yeah, like, the second one was just his foot. I can't remember what the third one was, but. Uh, I want a women's fire match. I'm going to put that out there. <laughs> my last one. I kind of struggled with picking my favorite debut pay-per-view, as I recall being like really, really jacked for the World Combat Championships. You ever heard <laughs> about this, Mike? Yeah, I remember those DVDs always being at Best Buy. Yeah, I was like, you know, a developing NHB geek at the time. And this is going to be my first viewing of Henzo Gracie, 
who was like touted in black belt, I feel like. I was like a way cooler Hoist Gracie. It was yeah. like if Hoist Gracie could punch, <laughs> um, but I couldn't pick that one earnestly. So uh, unsurprisingly, my favorite debut pay-per-view will be and will always be ECW's Barely Legal. <laughs> so I never got to see ECW live, obviously, because as most of you know, I'm from California. So we never got like fucking MSG Network or Sunshine Network or whatever. So when April 13th rolled around, I was pretty excited to see this shit live. Um since it was a pay-per-view, since it was a Sunday, uh, sadly, the following day was a school night, so I had to stop watching after the Lance Storm RVD match, <laughs> but I remember running home and then peeping that infamous M Pro six-man tag, which I just think was just, like, not a throwaway, but, like, they, of course, didn't intend uh, for that match to be the one that stood out the most. Everything else was kind of whatever, um, but it's probably the high that, like, all adult wrestling fans are still chasing to this day. And I don't ever foresee another pay-per-view, a debut pay-per-view at least, um, taking over this one in my head. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. Um, I was trying to think of pay-per-views, but I, I just can't, I don't have the memory for that. This whole thing was pretty difficult for me, honestly, because I just, that's the, I, my memory is just shot. I'm old. And... I remember being kind of hyped for King of the Ring, and I remember that being a pretty good show. Bret Hart had a really good show. Oh yeah. I was super hyped for King of the Ring. Yeah. Um, all, the, I wish they would bring that. Even though it would suck if they brought it back, but I still wish they bring it back. Um, but my last one is also ECW related. It's um, the debut of ECW on TNN. Oh, shit. That was like, uh, because I started watching ECW pretty early on. I'm pretty sure the first time I caught ECW on TV, yeah, it was like either the summer or fall of 1995. And I was pretty much watching... Since then, not religiously. I think it took a couple of years to be religiously because I was like still going to school and like wasn't remembering to watch wrestling all the time and stuff like that. But it it built up to religiously, and they were getting like dolls and they were getting shit in magazines, and it was just like getting bigger and bigger. And then they finally got like this mainstream show, and it was kind of just like I mean I don't think we're gonna ever see a trajectory like that in our lifetime because I don't think it could happen again like that. I don't think it could just be this tiny indie promotion that goes from like being tiny to like kind of cult to kind of, in, you know, nationwide to like worldwide, basically. Um, I just don't think shit set up like that anymore. Uh, you know, as you see, AEW just went from being nothing to AEW because that's, that's more likely these days. Uh, but in the end, I think it was, I was pretty disappointed um, the first episode I completely forgot is just a recap episode. So I don't remember how I felt about that, but I was probably pretty upset. I could imagine when that <laughs> happened because it was like, I saw everything they showed on that already. And I, so I watched the first and second episode today. The first episode starts with a 20, it starts with the Jerry Lynn and RVD from hardcore heaven 99. It's like a 25 minute match. That's some balls starting your new show with a 25 minute match. So I give him credit for just starting the show with that. Uh, but the second episode is the one that I remember more fondly. And that's the one that, um, they find out like, you know, I think a couple weeks before him that the Dudley boys are signing to WWF. And, uh, so it's like their last show and kind of, so that was kind of like the harbinger where I was just like, Oh man, the Dudley boys are leaving. So many people have already left and they have this like big show now, but that episode, man, it really holds up there in that Queens building there's it's fucking overpacked there are so many people in it everybody's going ape shit it has the ending where the dudley boys win the tag team titles on their last day in ecw and then they challenge tommy dreamer um they make a real bad beulah rape joke that is probably not uh not a thing you can get away with on fucking national television and is that where they say like they're gonna sneak into her hotel room and like show her the true meaning of a double team was yeah, that yeah. it oh yeah, my yeah. goodness but, but it's her, it's what a, the it's, fuck man it's her hospital room so yeah, it's even it's, worse oh my god but uh yeah you right. can, i don't think you can get away with that on any type of television in 2019 <laughs> Uh, but then Tommy, the, you know, Tommy Dreamer wrestles him. He's got his ass kicked and Raven comes out. So it's like the first time they team up and everybody loses their fucking shit. It's a great episode, but, uh, I kind of, I mean, I didn't hate ECW, but I thought that show on TNN sucked, man. It wasn't good. Um, Cyrus, like I all time worst dude for me. Um, I know, I know no one really hates on him out of all the people, people retroactively hate and say I've always sucked like Joey Styles and Jim Ross. No one hates on Cyrus, and I've hate. I think he's better now, or he was better when he was in New Japan. But back then, 
I just could not stand them. So that ruined the show for me. Then at the end, they started doing the stuff where they were like, um, like hating on TNN. And I was like, this is kind of corny. And, uh, you know, it wasn't really their fault. They were just like losing all of their wrestlers. And, uh, you know, eventually had to close down because it was down to like Chris Chetty and fucking, I don't even remember who else. It was, it was a sad display that, that final ECW roster is, is real sad. Um, but yeah, I can't, you know, I don't think there'll ever be in my lifetime me more pumped for a, a wrestling show to debut. A couple things here. Those ECW toys, they've never gone up in value. Like, I think New Jack is like readily available for like 12 bucks, which is kind of <laughs> sad. No, I think that, I mean, I think they hover around like 20 or 30. I mean, it's no, not big money, but yeah. Uh, also, Akuto Hidaka showing up on TNN. That was yeah. crazy. But yeah, during that time where like you had to root for Kid Cash, I was like, <laughs> yeah, this might be a free CW. I mean, but, if you look, if you, I am probably one of the biggest ECW apologists ever because people shit on it now. There's people who are like, oh, only the first two years were good. People are like, it was never good. You're all full of shit. It was basically good up until the last year, but. All of it was good. I don't care what you say. I don't care if you think it's problematic. I understand it probably was a little problematic. It was the 90s, so whatever. But, I mean, they were still trying to make chicken salad, chicken shit back then. And so even with Chris Chetty, it was like, man, if this guy wasn't Chris Chetty, like, <laughs> this would be pretty good still. But, yeah. That was it. If you want to revisit wrestling with us, too, email us. Maybe I'll send you something. <laughs> Up next, though, was the mixtape with La Parca, Juventud Guerrera, Tenru, Pac, and Teriyaki Boy? That's crazy. <laughs> Please stay tuned. here on virtual pros episode 88 and it is the mixtape segment every episode we pick we each pick a couple matches we throw them onto our virtual pros playlist which can be fi- found at either uh the youtube channel vrtl pros or you can just search virtual pros mixtape on the uh on the old youtube and it'll pop up i don't know if i hit something weird or just did it automatically but it finally formatted it so the newest matches are first I was so happy. I thought you did this on purpose. I was like, I don't have to scroll down anymore. This is actually the way it should have been for like two years. Yeah, I don't know if it's something I hit or just the, it was automatically on YouTube. But Also, really R.I.P. Good. Lightning Kid versus Sabu. Yeah. What the fuck, man? Yeah, man, that match was on YouTube forever. So God. I don't know if it's just people deleting their account or... I can't be copyrights, but it is, it is a sad day that that match is gone. Hopefully somebody else has uploaded it somewhere. Uh, anyway, so yeah, we each pick a few matches, we talk about them, and you can, like I said, you can follow along at home if you, uh, go to Virtual Pros Mixtape on YouTube. My first, first match of the night is, uh, La Parca and Psychosis versus Rey Mysterio and Juventud Guerrera from, uh, 1997, December 97 Nitro. Uh, I chose this match because, I don't know if he listened to the show, but this dude, Nicholas, I don't even know, I only know him through Facebook group, so I don't know if he goes by Nick or Nicholas, but either way. He uh he posted this match and he said that it was like his all time favorite match that was under ten minutes. So I was like, eh, maybe it's worth putting on the mixtape. So this is uh, you know, pretty much your WCW Lucha Guys kind of tag team. Um, as is tradition with those matches, they start off the commentators start off by just talking about the NWO for about five to ten minutes. Uh you kinda expect that if you've ever watched these matches, so uh that that's something. Um I can't tell because it's, you know, it's it's on YouTube. I'm sure it's clearer if I went to the WWE Network version, but 
So I can't really tell what these designs on Rey Mysterio's tights are. There's like some bigger designs, but then there's some smaller ones. And if you look at it, it kind of looks like the smaller ones are when um, later in the 2000s when the NBA would just sell all that merch that was just like all of the NBA teams on it. Yeah. So, so I'd like to think that uh, Rey Mysterio was wearing tights that had that on it, just all of the NBA teams. <laughs> but I think it was he would be a little before his time if that's what it was. But hey, Ray Ray, it's not too new, too late. You still wrestle. Why don't you make one of those all NBA team things? <laughs> I think about that a lot, and I think about that one or two years where they made NBA jerseys and the dresses. Oh, yeah, the Mariah Carey <laughs> Wizards shit. That yeah. shit was so crazy. Yeah. Uh, um. Anyways. uh, They're doing wrestling uh, dresses now. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. Um. So uh, this match, you know, this match is very good. And uh, there's a part, which I don't think I've ever seen this before, uh, this move at least, is that they did the psychosis and Hooventoot are going at it and they do this kind of not contrived, but they do this like elaborate thing where they basically end up on the top ropes where it looks like psychosis has the advantage and he like picks up. Um, yeah, he picks up Hooventoot to do kind of just like a power slam off the top rope and Hooventoot re- reverses it in the, in midair, like a fucking superhero and, uh, ends up slamming, uh, psychosis and then, uh, a pin attempt and i really don't think i've ever seen any shit like that in my life i don't even think will osprey does shit like that so i was pretty amazed um the whole match is kind of like uh it's it's crazy like obviously the people who do wrestling now like the kind of high flyers that do wrestling now they might be a little more skilled uh, like you know ricochet and will osprey people like that um uh, El Hijo del Viking. I don't know if he's more skilled, but he does more flippy shit. But um, it's but it, it's crazy because this this match is still like it's ninety five percent dudes doing flips, but it's not as contrived as as wrestling matches now. Like it's not over the top. Everything seems to make sense still. I probably sound like a fucking old vet talking like that, saying eh, everything used to make sense back then. But it is. It's <laughs> it's just like it's. I don't know. It just doesn't seem as contrived. And I'm not hating on that shit because I'm one of the few people on earth that likes Will Ospreay. And I think he does great shit, but I think there's a too much, too many of those moves where people like have to hold on to their ropes and like, you know, it's just like a little too much. So, uh, if you're an aspiring high flyer, just watch these matches and only these matches because, uh, these guys do it right. Uh, this match ends with like a sequence where Rey Mysterio like jumps out of the ring to do a Hurricane Rana and Hooventude jumps off the top rope to do a, uh, 450 on psychosis i believe and pin him and the quickness that hooventude busts off this 450 is pretty amazing he's just like gets on those ropes and does it immediately i don't even think he looked he just fucking did it and that is uh some absolute fearlessness uh late uh, after the match is over they hint that this was the uh you know the opening match on nitro and man that is it is super smart to be doing that i kind of was like whatever about the first few AEW matches because they were just kind of like these matches they threw out there with like no real context and i guess unless you pay attention to them being the elite youtube channel which i do not um but i i kind of see what they they try to do because they did put like a bunch of like super flippy dude matches first and i think they're trying to get that that appeal of like snagging people with that and i you know i think it worked on most people that got into nitro around that period because you would turn it on and the first match would be these dudes going buck doing this shit. So it's uh, something uh, WWE should think about <laughs> instead of uh, having like a 45 minute promo at the beginning of their, their episode and like sketches and shit. Maybe have guys actually wrestle and do crazy shit. But uh, yeah, this is a very good match. I don't know if it's my favorite match under 10 minutes, but I don't really have any way of judging that at the moment. But uh, definitely a recommendation. Yeah, so La Parka and Psychosis, they come out first, and I'm reminded that the uh, WCW thing, theme song squad, they're kind of ass. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. With that said, off top, Mike, what's the best WCW theme song you can think of? Was it um, was it Jericho or Raven that had the uh, the Nirvana ripoff? Oh no, it's a DDP. It's DDP had yeah, smells like Teen Spirit. Oh yeah, self high five. Ding, ding. I don't know, man. I fucking <laughs> I hate DDP, but that was that was a good one though. Uh, what was Benoit? Did Benoit have anything notable? It just sounded like some fucking like. Uh, yeah, they're all like, bad, man. They're all bad. 
it was like infomercial music. It was like that doesn't match with Chris yeah. Benoit's intensity. I mean, Hogan's was just like the best. Hogan's and NWO is the best by default because they're like real songs. But that's that's why it's not uh, it's it's unfair. I'm gonna go with the uh, NWO Wolfpack theme, if only because <laughs> I had read that Kevin Nash had heard um, Militia Burn on the radio, and he was like, "I want that," and uh, they made him like you know a great value version of that song. But I think it's a pretty good beat. <laughs> But yeah, the freneticism that this match starts off with is like pretty fucking unreal. Like case in point, I'm pretty sure like the Hoovy driver gets busted out like two minutes into the match. And then yeah. we get like fucking stereotope con helos like two minutes later. And I'm like, man, they're fucking wrestling, wrestling out here. So I'm starting to like vaguely remember this match now. Uh, cause you were talking about it, the spot where Juventud Guerrera, he essentially reverses a top rope body slam into his own body slam which i remember at the time was like bending people's fucking minds and like it sure is bending my mind uh, as i watched this it was pretty unreal i don't know if this was on purpose but if it was holy shit well yeah i don't know where this ranks but this has to be like one of the best all-time sprints in wrestling history like the crowd is on fire throughout um they did all this shit like in seven minutes like to me like this is an absolute must watch my first match of the night is Genichiro Tenru versus Naoki Sano, UWFI 817-1996. So I put this on, and I was like, holy shit, I've been to this stadium. I watched the uh, Yakult Swallows play the, play the Giants. Uh, shout out to one of my favorite Giants of all time, Nori Aoki. And uh, I sat in the bleachers next to this like American scout, and he was like just mowing box after box of edamame. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I was like, man, that has to be the best job of all time. <laughs> um, the crowd, though, in this uh, this event, it's looking pretty sparse. And I'm, I'm guessing it's because it's like 140 degrees outside because like Asia summers are no joke. So Naoki Sano, he might be most famous to American fans for being in those series of matches with the uh, Jushin Thunder Liger. Whereas Tenru is, you know, Tenru. And I'll find any reason to watch him. So I think the story of this match is that these two dudes, like, they're not on the same page at all. So, like, there's, like, a lot of really awkward pauses. But at the same time, they're just, like, hulking up on each other with, like, slaps and, like, kicks, which is pretty great. It uh, really picks up when Tenru, he starts, like, short arm, like, punching Sano in the face, like, super hard. And then when, like, the referee pulls him away, I'm pretty sure Tenru, like, he twists this dude's titty. <laughs> this is like nine minutes long. I think it's worth your time. I enjoyed it. What do you think, Mike? Uh, so yeah, as Al alluded to, they're in a stadium and it's it's fairly empty. I, it's it's a very big stadium, so yeah. I don't know what they were hoping for. I feel like the amount of people in there, they probably weren't hoping for a sellout. I would hope they weren't because that's a uh, real sad. But if you look, so you, mostly the hard cameras on the side of where the most people are, but for the far away shots, you can see the the remainder of the stadium and it's empty but you can still see people in like the highest tier like you know here and there and it's like dude are you really going to be that honest at that point and just stay in your seat like, just fucking <laughs> move down to the floor no one no one is stopping you i doubt security is that crazy there just just fucking go down to the floor but i respect them for being like nope this is what i paid for this is where i'm sitting i'm gonna sit forty-five thousand feet away and uh, they didn't have it on the Jumbotron of that, that stadium, though. Yeah. So I guess maybe you just want to relax. You want to have a lot of room. Just watch it on the Jumbotron. Um, they, uh, so at one point, Sano does their, uh, those kind of like fast slap strikes that they kind of do in these matches. And um, I was like, I was thinking like, why doesn't Shane McMahon just do to do that? Like, why can't show him somebody show him this? Show him this like twenty second, fucking twenty second clip, and just be like, dude, just do this. Like, you're not you're not gonna fucking hurt Seth Rollins with your slaps to to his stomach like that that fast. Just do that. It looks better than your punches. But then uh, Tenru, which I think is like I don't know if it's a signature move, but it's a move he's done before. Uh, he does those sumo palm thrusts. Yeah. And I was thinking, how cool would it be if Shane, Shane McMahon just started doing those? Like, if that was, like, his new move instead of those stupid bo MMA boxing punches he tries to do, if Shane McMahon just came out the gate doing sumo palm thrust to Roman Reigns, like, that's how he stops his spear. <laughs> just, like, sumo palm thrust to the face. 
uh, all the way into the corner. So, Shane McMahon, I really hope you watch this match. I don't think it's a really notable match otherwise, but um, I think you need you need to take some stuff from this match. Um, yeah, it, get, it it starts to get interesting at some point. As you've probably heard on the show, if you're a, like a long-time frequent le- listener, I'm not the biggest fan of these types of matches to begin with. Um, I like them when they're super violent. But when they're in the middle like this, I'm just kind of like, yeah. But it, it starts to get interesting because there are, like, it is kind of like Sano fighting back and doing these kicks when it just looks like he's going to get his ass beat. And it gets pretty interesting. But then um, Tenru beats him with a series of moves that, in certain circumstances, would be pretty crazy. Because he, he hits all the, the, like, the big power moves. Like, he definitely hits all the strong grapples. Like, he hits four strong <laughs> grapples in a special right in a row. <laughs> And so it makes sense that he would pin a guy after this, but they're done like so emotionless. And I don't know if it's just because like the crowd really isn't into it and there's not many people or Tanner is not into it, but it was kind of like a, a sad finish to this match. But yeah, I don't know. You know, you can watch it if you're bored, but otherwise I'd skip it. Um, my last match of the night is, uh, Teriyaki Boy, aka Kikitaru and Super Milo versus Quishinbo Kamen and Ebison the third. Although, I don't know if they really ever numbered episodes. I think that was just, like, whoever made the caption on YouTube. But I don't know. I don't fucking know things like that. But uh, this is the, uh, I guess it's, like, the 15th anniversary of Bapesta, or the Bape uh, promotion. Even though I don't think they were an active promotion for 15 years. So I think this is just the 15th anniversary of Bape itself, the company. Uh, It's from 2008. I uh, put this match on. This was just on my, like, watch later list. I think I was looking for any kind of uh, um, Kushinbo came in uh, Ebison matches that I haven't seen on YouTube. So, and I stumbled on this one. I definitely never saw this before, so I put it on here. If you guys are unaware, if you guys did not follow uh, World Hip Hop Hip Hop Music in 2005, uh, the uh, Kikitaro is playing the the character of Teriyaki Boy, which is basically Kikitaro except with a jacket on it that says Teriyaki Boys which was a rap group from Japan in uh, the early to mid-2000s that were supposed to be like a big deal worldwide. They were assigned to quote-unquote Def Jam Japan, which I don't know if that's a real label. (laughs) I I don't know if there's any other artists on Def Jam Japan, but they were kind of like this... They're not a super group themselves, but they like had a lot of money put put behind them. They were like... I I don't know what Nigo had to do it from from Bape. I don't know if he's their manager, but he was involved. Pharrell was involved. Um, their debut album, Beef for Chicken, has like a murderer's row of producers on it. Like you couldn't get all these producers to do. I mean, at the time, now they're just like wash dudes. But like, I don't think you get all these people on an American rap record because it's just like such a crazy variation. It's fucking Daft Punk produced a song on here. Dan the Automator, uh, DJ Shadow, which is a song that the Teriyaki Boy Kikitaro comes out to, is the DJ Shadow song on here. Ad Rock from the Beastie Boys, Just Blaze. Cornelius, which is super weird. Uh, the Neptunes, weird. of course. Uh, Michael 5000 Watts, which of course Swisher House was hot as hell at the time. Um, Cut Chemist. Yeah, Mark Ronson, who was like a huge A-list star at the time. Uh, and, you know, I I had this record. I illegally had it. I didn't like buy it or anything, but it's pretty fucking good for the time. I'm sure, like, I haven't listened in a while. It's uh, So it probably sounds a little dated. But uh, if you never heard it and you're into that era of rap music, I would definitely check it out because it's pretty good. Um, anyways, that's the music history lesson is over. Uh, so, um, there's a, there's a weird four count in this match. I don't, I don't understand that joke. <laughs> I don't know if that's a joke that is a, a long lasting joke in Japanese comedy wrestling. And I've always missed it, but, or if it was just for this night, but they do a one, two, two, four count. And that's, uh, or maybe it's one, two, two, three, I mean, but either way they count two twice and it's, it's kind of weird. Uh, um, there's a, like a spot where, so super Milo is just, it's, he's some guy, some indie wrestling guy that's in a, um, like a Lucha style mask of Milo, the, the mascot or whatever you would call it from Bape. And, uh, he does the spot where he, they're, they all do the thing where it's supposed to be like the quadruple, uh, Boston crab, but Milo can't turn him all over because he's too weak. And then he takes off his regular Milo mask and reveals like a, an angry Milo mask. And then he's like strong enough to do it. And uh, if any American comedy wrestlers are listening to this out there, 
that wear masks, you got to steal this idea because it, it's pretty funny. Like I was laughing. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to ever cite the 2008 Bape show. So you can totally steal this gimmick and no one will ever notice. So just uh, watch this and steal that gimmick because it's great. Um, there's a lot of talking in this match, which I don't understand, but I'll just pretend it was funny because uh, the crowd is laughing. So I'm sure it was really hilarious. Uh, and I thought Milo was just going to be some bum. Like, I was like, this dude's probably one of their friends, like one of the Bape guys' friends. I just wanted to be in a match. <laughs> I didn't, ex- I didn't expect him to have moves or anything, but he has moves. He doesn't show them for a while, but he does this crazy walking on the ropes missile drop kick that I was like, whoa, holy shit! Yeah, and I can't he- do that. I can't. Do that <laughs> and then he does that uh, inverted four fifty. What is that called? I, you said this like the last episode. Oh five four. Oh yeah, the O five four. Um, so he has some moves. Uh, this is a decent match. This is definitely not the top uh, Kikataro Ebison style match that I've seen. Uh, but as, as you know, like a little history piece, if you're a streetwear and wrestling person, it's pretty interesting. Uh, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. Front row of this show just fucking dipped in thousands of dollars <laughs> of Bathing Ape. Had me super happy at 2.30 in the morning when I was watching this match. So 2008 was 11 years ago. What's the better rap record, Mike? The Carter 3 or 808s and Heartbreak? Oh man, that's a tough one. I don't like either of those. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would make the Carter 3. I don't I don't like that 808s record at all. I don't even I, I don't understand. People still say they like that record. I don't believe them. <laughs> a milli man, it's undefeated. I love the Carter 3. Oh, that's so, on the Carter 3. Oh, um, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Definitely the Carter 3. Absolutely. So apparently, Ukes, uh, they're having like an internal development team create a, a game to compete with the team that makes WWE 2K. And I just kind of had like a pretty brilliant idea for the team, since they're probably listening. Like, you got to do a comedy wrestling simulator. Like, if it's something <laughs> like Yakuza, like that mini game, or their mini games yeah. where like each move <laughs> is like a choose your own adventure, with each <laughs> spot where like you're having to work for like certain crowds. I think this would do like gangbuster sales. And I know two pretty charming wrestling fans that would potentially be down for writing for this game. But yeah, I might cover this. Uh, Super Milo changing masks, masks to change emotions was like one of the coolest moments in wrestling. Um, but at the end, he, he does hit that 054 and like, I feel like he fucks up whoever he landed on pretty, like, I feel like his knee hit his face. It was fucking crazy. This might be like the most devastating high flying move I've ever seen. Oh uh, yeah, it was pretty decent. I liked it. The last match of the night is Pac versus Adam Hangman Page, 518, 2019. This was, this is for WrestleGate Pro. Uh, this clip, it leads off with some entrance music playing and the announcers uh they state you know whose music that is and as a uh, as one half of the reigning and defending wrestling podcast champions i don't know whose music this is <laughs> even though i know who's wrestling so i guess i'm a poser uh wrestlegate pro a bland name for a wrestling promotion or blandest name for a wrestling promotion what do you think man i one of my jokes is that i I don't even, this might be made up, man. This, they might have just, <laughs> like, they had to do this match on, you know, everybody knows the story why they had to do this match, but I don't doubt they just booked a studio and they were like, we're going to make WrestleGate Pro. That is, uh, the name of this, this company. <laughs> yeah, it because, sounds like a shell company or something, man. Because not know. only is it, is it named WrestleGate Pro, but it's packed. So obviously there's other people who know, who know of this. I've never heard of it. So I don't know. <laughs> All right. So I, uh, in the middle of the match, uh, Pac hits a pretty far 450 splash. And, like, I apologize for never, ever mentioning his name in the Sabu Early Funeral Award. <laughs> like, maybe because, like, his high flying is so cleanly done is why I never really think to mention Pac. But, like, that dude has the bunnies, man, as, as some people say in my uh, pick-up basketball group. Um, Hangman, he clotheslines Pac out of his boots towards the end, which is fucking something. But yeah, this uh, probably isn't fair to this match to bring out the stringent grading scale, as everyone knows what happens, and they weren't gonna they weren't gonna bring the rice out for WrestleGate Pro. Uh, <laughs> but this definitely like it ticks a lot of checkboxes that I that I like. I like Orihara Moon Salts. I like uh, kicks in the dick, and I like a very super tepid both these guys chant. Um, I'm probably gonna forget about this match next week, but I don't think I wasted my time watching this match. What'd you think? 
Uh, yeah, another conspiracy point that I wrote down to maybe, you know, hammer my point that maybe WrestleGate Pro isn't real is that uh, Hangman Page gets a pretty wild response that I would not expect. Like, he comes out and it's just like a fucking macho man Randy Savage rose from the grave <laughs> and was ready to challenge Pac. People are losing their shit and I don't know. That just seems seems a little, a little over the top. I did um, see that too. Like this one guy, his vein was like begging to come out of his <laughs> neck, man. It was nuts. People were losing it. Yeah. Uh, this, and to further that point, like halfway through the match, and the announcers are still like overplaying it so hard, going, "I still can't believe we're seeing this match." <laughs> and it's like, okay, you said it one, you said it like ten times, but you know, you said it once at the beginning. That should be enough. We don't need to hear that anymore. <laughs> and uh, the dude was like still losing his shit halfway in the match. Uh, the wrestling's fine in this. There's um a part where Puck, like they're fighting on the outside, and Puck jumps up the rape the apron, and then the second rope, and then does a moonsault. But uh, Hangman Page moves, and he kind of just lands on his feet like it's no big deal, and that, that was pretty crazy. And then Hangman at the same time jumps up the top rope and does a moonsault. And that was also pretty crazy. Again, probably would not do that for WrestleGate Pro, but it's <laughs> it's uh it looked it looked really dangerous. Um. There's a at one point you could hear a very faint the elite chant and it's just like one dude doing it so that's a, yet again another conspiracy because uh why would only one person know this if they want all crazy ape shit for Hangman Page seems weird uh I just don't connect with Hangman Page I don't there's something about him where I'm just like eh whatever like, like he's a good wrestler uh I've seen a ton of his matches now and I I he's kind of like a the revival where I don't know their names. Like I know there's Dash Wilder and I think they're both named Dash Wilder. Like <laughs> I don't know the other guy's name. Scott Dawson. Scott Dawson, there we go. There's Scott Dawson, Dash Wilder, and they're guys who for their first two years, I always expect both of them to be bald because I just I just picture them in my head as two bald guys. And then when I watch him, I'm like, why does that guy have hair? And then I'm like, he's always had hair. And I'm kind of like that with Hangman Page where he does like a moonsault. And I'm just like, I thought he just like punch people. But he, he does that in like every match. And I'm just like, I never notice because I just don't connect with the guy. Uh, so it's, it's not you, Hangman Page. It's me. This match, of course, finishes with a corny DQ. And basically it's like Hangman hey Page gets the upper hand and Pop can't take it. And he kicks the referee in the balls. And it's cool kicking people in the balls. Don't get me wrong. That's that's funny. But like, if you're gonna if you're doing a match and it's like everybody kind of knows that it's gonna be a DQ. Well, I don't know if people knew in the audience, but uh, this match was presented to uh, the regular public as a match that ends in a DQ. Basically, if you're gonna go in a match doing that, just like why don't you do like a violent weapon attack? Just like fucking pull out a knife or scissors or something and stab the dude. But so. But then, you know, I wrote that down, and then, you know, the bell rings, and they DQ him, and then Pac pulls out a chair and starts fucking him up with it. Like, why didn't he just, like, get the DQ on that? It's, like, it's way tougher. You're not kicking the guy in the balls. It's not stupid. Like, if you're just going to kick the dude in the balls in the first place, just do it at the beginning of the match. Why do you do all that wrestling? It's fucking stupid. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's 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 a fun match, I'm sure, if... uh you're the type of person that could go into a match and know get it ends on a DQ. And there are people who I think could do that. It's not me though. <laughs> like, um, I was like the whole week I was like, I should probably watch that match. And I was like, why? I know how it ends. It ends on a DQ. Uh, but you know, some people could separate that shit. So it's pretty decent if, if you are one of those people. Otherwise I would definitely avoid this. That was episode 88 of that world champion sound. Hit us on Twitter, Instagram, VRTL pros, hit us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, if you want to participate, email us at virtualpros64 at gmail.com. The Mid-Year Report, next episode. And I do think, let me check my calendar. Let me uh, do some math here on my hands. I think it's the 25th anniversary of 6394. I think it's going to be a pretty big episode. Any last mm -hmm. words, Mike? Uh, no, thank you. See you guys in two weeks. <laughs>